the Director of Division of Antiquities in the Ministry of Natural Resources and Tourism, United Republic of Tanzania. Fabian died last week at a very young age and most probably from COVID. So all my, uh, uh, all my Zamani colleagues and I work closely with Fabian, especially on Mafia Island, and he was one of uh, the participants of our BMA exhibition. You can see uh, the webpage that he wrote on uh, the site, the Swahili site of Kua. So I know and I think that my colleagues will agree that today's lecture will be a tribute to Fabian's uh, work and friendship and uh, rest, uh, rest in peace, uh, Fabian. So today's public lecture is linked to our virtual exhibition, Black Monument Matter, that I had the pleasure to create with Professor Heinz Rother from University of Cape Town, South Africa. Black Monuments Matter is an academic response to the world mo movement, Black Lives Matter. The exhibition highlights African contributions to the world history by exhibiting world heritage monuments and architectural treasures from sub-Saharan Africa. Black Monuments Matter and also Black Cultures Matter. Our exhibition also contributes to the awareness on African identity and African heritage. Sites and monuments are physical representations of history, heritage and development in society. Through an approach founded on the latest knowledge and technology, this online exhibition offers visitors an opportunity to learn more about the glorious monuments and sites of African heritage and black cultures across sub-Saharan Africa. All the documentation presented today and in the exhibition are the result of many years of dedicated work by the Zamani Project, funded by Professor Heinz Rutter, who is the director of the project from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. I had the pleasure to work with Heinz, Bruce, Roshan, and Stephen in uh, Kua on Mafla Island, Tanzania. Later, I work with Ralph on the website of the exhibition. Today, these three pillars of the team, scholars and surveyors are presenting their work and research. Bruce McDonald, Roshan Borta, Ralph Schroeder will present the technology and the work behind the exhibition. They will introduce us to some documented sites and the recent house of wonder collapse in Zanzibar. Thank you and I think I will give you all the floor. Thank you, Stefan. Hi, uh, thanks Stefan, Alex for organizing this. Thanks to the Aga Khan Institute. And uh, I'm also very sad to hear the passing of, of uh, Fabian, that's sad. So um, yeah, I don't know what to say, it's, it's shocking. Uh, so I hope you're all well and healthy and let's make sure we keep it that way. So, I just wanted to introduce uh, you to the Zamani team first before uh, we delve into the talk. Uh, uh, Professor Hans Ruter, who is our principal, principal investigator, he started uh, the Zamani project around the, the year 2004, and uh, we've been going since then. And on your top right, you will see uh, Ralph Truder, uh, sitting somewhere in Myanmar. On the lower left, you will see uh, Bruce McDonald, and then there's myself on the lower right. Uh, all three of them except me are, are uh, surveyors. Ralph has a lot of expertise in GIS, and Bruce has worked overseas as a professional surveyor. He has a lot of experience in Northern America and uh, Europe. So yeah, and me, I'm an electrical engineer and computer scientist. So today, Hans unfortunately couldn't be with us, but we will try our best to represent him. So we are based at the University of Cape Town in the Geomatics Division uh, 
GCD. And uh, <clears throat> just to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about, I will give you a brief overview of Zamani in general. And uh, Ralph will give you uh, uh, an overview of the BMM website, which uh, mostly is his work. Thanks, Ralph, for, for doing such a, for creating such a great uh, website. And uh, he will also show some of the special documentation work that we did in Great Zimbabwe. And we've been there a couple of times and he will walk you through um, uh, um, all the work that we've done there. And finally, we will end with Bruce, who will give you uh, an idea of our field work and some of the fun we have there and the data processing. And he will be talking specifically about the Kua ruins and he will also show a bit of the House of Wonders structure that um, we'll, we will discuss later. So just a brief overview now of um, the money project. Heinz uh, came to South Africa from Germany in the 1970s, and he hasn't left since. So he started documenting heritage sites, in a way, informally in the, in the 70s with his with his other colleagues at, at the University of Cape Town. And this was later formalized in about 2012, sorry, in 2004, when we got funding from the Mellon Foundation to, to actually employ uh, free full-time staff members to systematically document heritage sites in Africa. So that piece of, uh, that amount of funding lasted until 20, um, 2012. And after 2012, we've been funded by the Zamani African Cultural Heritage Sites Trust. And we've still been funded by that uh, trust. So the principal objectives of, of what we do is basically to document sites and structures for, for future generations, for the next, uh, uh, for the kids of the future and also to create information for students, scholars, anybody who, who wants to, uh, to learn more about these sites. And uh, obviously, we also provide data for professionals with, uh, who wants to do conservation work and restoration work. Like, for example, Stefan Pratin works, um, the work we, we've done with him on Pua. More objectives of, of what we do is to create awareness of Africa's heritage uh, in Africa and the rest of the world. And this is uh, for the BMM um, project. This is, this is um, exactly what, what it is about. We, we want to create more awareness of Africa's heritage. And uh, also we use our work for site management. Uh, when people with our spatial data it makes it easier to manage sites, for example, using maps and GISs. So, so all of these are, are our objectives. And, and if there are, are structures that, that uh, need to go on a UNESCO, the World Heritage Site listing, we can also contribute to that by making some 3D models, some maps, and then you can take these and, and go, go uh, through the proper channels to get them. And we, our work also promote and support tourism. And also we, we, we build capacity wherever we can um, on site. So we train people, we, we, we train uh, young uh, archeologists how to, how to, um, how to take uh, panoramas and to understand the laser scan data, which is very important for us. Not necessarily how to, how to use the whole thing, but have a good understanding of what it can do and what are its limitations. And the principles that, that we stick to at Zamani is we do not interpret the data. We are engineers, we are surveyors, we do not pretend that we understand the whole history of it or, um, or what it means. We, we, we capture the data scientifically as accurately as possible and then we pass on and we work with experts like fun to go um, to do the interpretation and we work closely with a lot of experts like this we we do not claim that um, we know the, the whole history of, of of the data 
And also on sites, we do not just do laser scans. Uh, I will come into that later. We try to have a holistic approach. We, we capture data in many formats, so we can see uh, the site in many different ways. Uh, one important thing is all the data that we capture, we, we restore them in a way forever at the university in very in raw format. So in the future, when you have better computers, better techniques, we can reprocess all this data. And we create metadata for all the objects that we have, which is, which is essential for archiving. Uh, the instruments, the techniques that we use, technologies are is laser scanning. This is our main tool. Photogrammetry uh, with, with uh, SLR cameras and drones. We use satellite imagery, GIS, uh, GPS, surveying, uh, high dynamic range panoramas, photography, videos. So as you can see, we've got, we've got in our tool set, we've got a lot of things that we can do to document uh, the sites. This is a, a quick uh, uh, map of the output that we produce. We produce 2D data, 3D data, image sets, and sometimes we get contextual data from other people that we add to our data. So for the 2D stuff, we create maps, we create elevations of buildings that is used a lot by architects, elevation sections and plans. And for the 3D data, we create font clouds, uh, we cre create um, terrain models, and now we are starting to create virtual reality uh, models, and Bruce will take you into that as well. And we, we have massive uh, collection of, of uh, images that we capture for, for each side. For example, in, uh, in Sri Lanka, we captured about, I think, 20,000 photos. So we capture massive amounts of data wherever we can. So overall, for over the last, I think, 18 years or so, um, we have documented about 250 sites, uh, uh, mostly in Africa and then Asia, Myanmar, um, Middle East. Uh, we've lot, worked a lot in Petra and, like I said, mostly Africa. So we have collected about 100 terabytes of data all of these reside uh, on uh, some secure servers at the University of Cape Town. And as you can imagine, managing all of this is, is quite a mission, creating creation of metadata and things like that. So, so this is a whole um, mission in itself, managing all, all of these. And how do we dis disseminate all this data? There are, there are a few ways. Firstly, uh, we, if you go to our website and you, you see something, you can get in touch directly with us and we can see how we can get you this data. Uh, Ziva Hub is, is, a, is a new platform at the university where, where we put our data and uh, you can go and download the data for free for research purposes. And actually, um, if you search for Zamani project on Ziva Hub at UCT, you will see the KUA data set that you can download. For, for, for research purposes. And the Zamani website is, is, a, is a nice collection. It gives you a nice overview of what we have. Obviously, we can't put everything on that, but it's, it's, a, it's a nice uh, front to the data sets that we can provide. And some of our older data is on JSTOR as well. We have worked with uh, World Monuments Fund, UNESCO, the Getty, and a lot of uh, researchers and government institutions. Hopefully I haven't forgotten someone. And I just want to go briefly through some of the projects of, uh, of what we've done and, and what we can do with those money data. So the first project that I want to, to showcase here are the pyramids of Meroe in Sudan. Uh, these, these pyramids, we, we documented that, I think, about uh, uh, a decade ago. These are, I think, third century BC, uh, used to be the capital of the Kingdom of Kush. And we, we have uh, laser scanned all of these pyramids in the northern and the southern symmetry, if I'm correct. And I will show you briefly how they look like. 
I'm just going to stop sharing that. So this is a panorama tour uh, of the Meroe pyramids, the, the northern field. Uh, this panorama tour you can access from our website. And as you can see, this on the on the top right, there is a mini map where you can click on these little circles, and it will take you to that particular position, and then you can enjoy the view from from that particular position. And uh, there are about I think twenty pyramids into into that into this northern field. And uh, you can zoom in and out. You can you can you can jump into the panorama itself. You can jump into it and then jump to another location. As you can see, it was a fantastic trip. Just trying to jump another location, taking some time here. So you can enjoy this on your own uh, in, in 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 your own time, uh, whenever you can. All the links are found. Um, in, uh, on the Zamani website. We also have 3D models online. I don't know if you can see my screen here. You've got here one of the pyramids uh, of Meroe, is pyramid number one, correct? So this is how it looks like. You can also see that there's a link to this to the structure on the Zamani website. And so this is, all little, very nice little things to explore a site. And uh, let me get back to my presentation. So, so this, this is one of the facades of, of one of the pyramids. So architects took the 3D model and, uh, and they, they used it for their work. They, they, they used the, the, the facade this diagram to mark which rocks are broken, uh, which parts are missing, if there are cracks. So this is how uh, how they often use our our three D data, and we we find great satisfaction when we see that our data is being used and not just being shelved somewhere in an archive. Uh, just to come to another uh, project, this is a sad one. Uh, two weeks ago, we were in uh, Zanzibar to document uh, this building. This is called the House of Wonders. This is how this building looked like uh, before December last year. Um, this building was built by one of the sultans of Zanzibar. It's called the House of Wonders uh, simply because it was the first building in Zanzibar to have electricity. And also, I think, the first uh, building in Zanzibar to have a lift. So this is how it looks like now. The building collapsed. Um, the building collapsed uh, in, on, on Christmas day last year. And that was a real catastrophe. And there was a loss of life. I think four people uh, passed away. There were people working there, uh, local workers and, and, and they died. So that was a, that was a real tragedy that, that happened there. And, uh, Zamani, uh, we were there last week, uh, two weeks ago, to go document the structure that has been left behind. But uh, this is this is another view of 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 the building to see the extent of the damage. You can see the whole left of the the whole right of the building is gone, and the tower is also gone. As you can see here, there is a tower. The tower is is completely gone. The whole thing collapsed. And uh, we are trying to stabilize the building as we speak. So in 2019, Zamani was there. And luckily, we had scanned that building. We, were, we went there to scan it. And uh, we, we have a complete 3D model of, of the building inside and outside. And, uh, and this data can now be used to reconstruct um, the building, can be used for plans and, and sections and to make very accurate measurements. So this is this is one one use of 
of data, of, of 3D data that, I mean, it's very sad what, uh, what happened there, but um, this is how the data can be used. I mean, we have a full 3D of that. And later Bruce will, will show a little VR uh, of, of that building that, that he has done. And thank you for listening to me. Hope it wasn't too boring. And I will, I will uh, let my colleague, uh, Ralph, Mr. Ralph Schroeder, yeah. the good Ralph, to take over from me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you see me? Hello. Thank you very much, Roshan. I also would like to thank Stefan and Alexandra and the Aga Khan Institute to, uh, for this occasion to, to showcase the, the, our work that we do, that we did the past yeah, almost 18 years. Um, and I will start, uh, so my, I will talk first briefly, just a few minutes about the Black Monument Matter website, where you can find all the data that we talk about today. Well, all the 3D models and the panorama tools that Roshan was now showing and other sites. And after that, I will uh, uh, concentrate about the field work or the spatial documentation of Great Zimbabwe. I'm gonna share my screen now here. So one moment, so, okay. So this is now the, the landing page of the Black Monuments Meta website. And here you, you can see uh, the three buttons and uh, the, the two top ones are two possible ways to kind of to, to get to the exhibition or to the sites which, which we have there. So one, one way would be enter the exhibition by site name or the other way you can go is enter the exhibition by their location. And I would like to start by entering the exhibition by location. I wanna click on this button now and now a map will come up which nicely indicates how the sites are located in which countries. So your top left, we have Mali. If I click on it, this is for example now Timbuktu, this is a ginger bear mosque. Or here, there's also Mali and this is uh, Jenna, the great mosque of Jenna. Uh, and over here, this one was, Roshan was now uh, talking about briefly is the Miroa pyramids. And now actually, if you, would if you would like them to go to the actual site, then you on the left here, you can click on the link and you come straight to the site with our data. Before I talk a little bit more, I just wanna go back to the landing page. There we go. So this was the way entering exhibition by location. The other route that you can go is this button here by site name. If you click on that, you will get a nice overview alphabetically, which sites are available. And you can see, so we have Ethiopia, something from Ethiopia. We have something from Ghana, Kenya and Gede, Mali, Sudan, Tanzania with a Kua. This is the interesting project that uh, Stefan was involved on site and afterwards, I mean, this is his kind of his baby. And, and, and we were uh, happy to, to help him to create some data that, that he can use in the end uh, uh, for his research. And on the bottom here uh, is Great Zimbabwe, which I will talk soon about it. Just one on, on top here, the usual buttons that normally website have, we have also the exhibition sites here or location of the sites. So this is the corresponding, you can, if you click on it, you come either to the map, oh, sorry, here you come to the map, back to the map, or you come to the overview with the site names. Uh, the last thing I want to mention, no, yes, is our digital products. If you clear, I mean, so for each of our sites, I'm now in Lalibela. You have 
we offer normally a th at least a 3D model, and we have sometimes not always we have videos. We have sometimes panorama tours. We have photographs, plans and sections, images of 3D models, and maps. So pretty much what uh, Roshan said before. This is kind of our, our, our output data that we produce. And now, uh, if you would click on any of those, it would guide you to the corresponding data. Or you can just browse manually. I mean, you scroll down and you find nice organized there's videos, there's a panorama tour, and so on, some maps and plans. So this is nicely organized for, for, each, for each of the sites or the structures. So this was just a brief overview of, about the BMM website. What I'm gonna do, so my main talk is going to be now, I'm talking about Great Zimbabwe, which is in Zimbabwe. And, uh, so the next 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna talk now about the field work or spatial documentation about Great Zimbabwe. And now on, on the slide, you can see on the left, on, there's the hill complex on that little hill on that mountain. And on the right, you see the great enclosure. The picture is taken from the top of the hill complex down to the great enclosure. So they're quite close to each other. It's about, about 800 meters so straight. And this map here gives you a top view or the, a map showing from the top. And you can see on the bottom, the great enclosure. And on top of that map is the hill complex. And the distance, I, I don't know exactly, but it's about 800 meters or a kilometer. So not, not too far away from each other. By the way, this map was created based on our documentation in 2007. So we used the data then to create this kind of map and other maps as well. But Okay, before I talk more about the field work itself, I just want to give you a little bit impression for each of the sites. So I would like to start with the great enclosure. So uh, uh, it's dated around the 14th century. And you can see from this picture nicely, it's a circular structure so the outside wall, which you need, a, I, I mean, if you walk around it, it's about 250 meters that you have to walk to, to go one round around the great enclosure. And um, yeah, so this next picture shows the entrance of the great enclosure. And here you can see nice also on the left again, on that hill, the hill complex. So how they relate to each other. So it's, it's actually a very beautiful site. Uh, and I had the pleasure to be there um, two times. I've, I've been there 2007 uh, and then again in 2017. And I will tell you all about it, late, I mean, now soon in, when we talk about the field work. This picture is taken inside the great enclosure. And there you can see this is kind of the main structure or yeah, so the, the kind of spectacular part inside there's about 10 meter high uh, a tower, which also built out of stone. So everything there, all the walls are built out of the stones and it's quite very impressive. And um, the con condition of the site is also ve very good. I mean, they're, they seem to be taking very good care of it. Um, although it's, it's really worth going there if, if you can. This picture I chose because it gives you a good idea what dimensions are we talking about? So this is the outside wall, more or less on the highest point, which is uh, about 10 meters high. I think if you would measure it, you come somebody to nine meter and 70 or some, something in that range. But you get a good idea about the person and the wall gives you a good feeling about the size. So what I want to do next now, to just to get you more familiar, with the site, I want to share, or I, I would like to show you now a video. Um, 
So this, this is not a video that I'm gonna play. This is a video of our 3D model um, of, great, of, of the great enclosure. And there's, there's some sound to it. So the video is about two minutes long and you can enjoy now, you get a better impression now of, of um, how it looks, especially from the air. So this, what you see now here is the entrance that you fly over. So, and I, I say it again, so this, what you see is not a, it's a 3D model that we created. Uh, but it was not created from our data, which were acquired in 2007. The, the technology didn't allow, or it was not possible to, to create it, especially in, with the textbooks, the real color. But this model was created from the data that we acquired 10 years later, in 2017. But I will talk, I mean, I will talk about this in detail a little bit later when I talk about the field. So this is the entrance. And what you see now, I missed it again. Uh, there was this mesh outside. So now you can see it. So it's a little bit tricky. So you see the 3D model embedded in kind of the real environment, which uh, uh, Bruce, my colleague who's speaking after me now, he uh, uh, did this fantastic video and other videos as well. You can see now he's blending in a, a little bit kind of the structure which is underneath, which we call a mesh. A mesh. So when we talk about a 3D model, so what we get out normally is a, a mesh, a 3D mesh, and then on, over this mesh, then we can lay uh, these textures. Quite a, 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 a long and, and, and complicated process. Okay. Thank you for that. I'm going to now go back to my presentation. And now I show you some impressions of the hill complex. So the hill complex is, uh, uh, so they, uh, uh, science of co uh, construction about 900 CE. And it's, uh, it's believed that it was used for, or as the religious center of the site. So these two pictures on the left, this is the entrance. You walk underneath the, this big wall into kind of in, inside the, the hill complex. And on the right, I chose the picture. You can see the orange arrow pointing down. And this is actually where you come out. When you go left inside this, this entrance, you will come out on the other side. And it looks like this. I, I don't, I didn't choose more pictures because I think the best impression is also a 3D, our 3D model, um, which I will now, I will now show you the 3D model of the hill complex. And you will see now in the beginning of this video, you can see again the relationship from great enclosure to the hill complex, how they are laying. So this is now the hill complex and Bruce also did this video. He makes fantastic stuff, really impressive. Uh, but you also must say to us, I mean, we are doing a good job by creating this fantastic model. So, <laughs> but he's also good to put it in, in motion. So you see, uh, there are some gathering places. You can see there are some kind of seating areas where they probably were sitting together and, and you know, do their thing. So this was a little bit shorter, but I'm sure you got an impression of how this site looks like. And now I have to switch back to my... So the next... Um, come on. 
The next thing is actually now the, the interesting part, I think for everyone now always, about the actual fieldwork. So this is a picture from the fieldwork in 2007. This is our equipment. And we, had, we, we brought along that time three laser scanners. We had survey instrument like a total station. We had a GPS, just, but not an RTK. We had a, a standalone, like we put it up on one point and you wait a couple of hours to get a kind of accurate reading. And we had generators and fuel and petrol. Here um, is the laser scanner in action. It's, it's a Leica HDS 3000. So this was, or yeah, when I joined the project in, in 2005, that was kind of the instrument that we had in the beginning. Uh, to zoom in here, you can see on the left, I circled it in red, you can see something gray. This is the huge battery, which this machine is run on. And on the right here is just a close-up shot of the battery. And you can also see on the left side, well, not so clearly, but you can see a cable running down. I mean, one is for the battery and the other one is for a laptop. So the whole instrument is controlled through a laptop. This is another scanner we had with us. It's the HDS 4500, which looks different, which has a, works different. Uh, it is, it was, it is faster as the HDS 3000, but it is, it doesn't have the same range as, as the HDS 3000, which I was showing before. So this mostly we, we used for inside scans and for quicker setups and the, the 3000 we, we used for, for longer distance. I mean, where we had to reach maybe higher parts. And you can see clearly also here, Lots of cables to run it, extension links. In the bottom one, this square looks like a suitcase or like a baby suitcase um, box is a battery which powers the, the machine. And you see my former colleague, Chris, uh, uh, controlling it via a laptop. This is a nice shot showing that uh, we set up also on top of the wall, we got permission we had to ask, obviously we, we're trying to, to not destroy anything, uh, um, but it, it was kind of essential to have at least one. So we just had one scan on top of the wall. It was essential for our work to, to put it kind of all together, it, it helped. And this is the third laser scanner. It, we, it, it's, a, it's called a scan station, which is a modified HDS 3000 scanner. Unfortunately, in this picture, it's covered. Uh, so this is the same shot, just well, the same situation, just a different angle now, but you can see the dimension, huge wall. And you can see here, uh, uh, Professor Ruto on top, uh, uh, um, the project leader, the project leader. Um, and the, the scanner is covered because we had in between, we had some range showers and it is impossible to, to work with the instrument when it rains. So it would get false, false data because the laser beam would hit the raindrops and they would just yeah, give false readings. This is now uh, the campsite that we had not far away from the actual, from, from the great enclosure. And you can see the general generators running um, to supply us with power so we could also then work with our laptops there. And there's one thing I would like to show you now. Don't get a shock. So this, um, this nice little spider, uh, I was told it was an African baboon spider. We were sitting in the grass around the great enclosure on, on one spot and uh, about five meters from us, uh, this little creature was, um, yeah, crawling past us. It was uh, after that. I mean, the, after that, uh, people were not sitting so much in the grass anymore. I mean, me too. <laughs> I was a little bit more careful um, to get an idea. It, although it's it's almost a head size full. It's a sm slightly smaller as a as a grown hand. So it, it's quite in, quite impressive. Um, this thing. I don't think it's deadly. 
if you get bitten by it, but you probably don't want to be bitten by that one. So now a little bit more technical here. So after now, um, we came back after about eight days of field work, we came back now, we had the three laser scanners working in the field and they are now displayed here over a top view. This great top view of the great enclosure is also derived from this 3D model that we did in 2007, which was just kind of black and white and it didn't have color. But you, you, you can see nicely here the distribution of the laser scans. And as I pointed out, the, the blue one, the blue dots, the Leica HDS 4500 uh, is, is faster, much faster as the HDS 3000 and also faster as the scan station. So much more scans were taken with the 4500, which you can see here. The same I did now uh, um, just to show you, this is now for the Hill Complex, the top view of, of the Hill Complex also derived from the 3D laser scan model from 2007. I just do the number of scans. So the Hill Complex we did in all 107 scans. Let me just go back. And here we did 123 scans. And here is a picture now, an oblique shot of the 3D model based on the data in 2007. Um, I think we were quite, uh, 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 I mean, when we started, when Heinz started the project and we created first models and people were quite impressed uh, uh, that we were able to do that. Um, and we were really one of the first groups in the world to actually documenting heritage site this way. So it was, was very, very new. This uh, is now the 3D model of the Hill Complex. Um, yeah, you can see all the holes in it. I mean, it, it just, yeah. So we had to live kind of with holes, but also it, we were able to fill holes, but then it's the question, as soon as you start filling holes with kind of what you think should be there, then you alter the reality. So, so we, we try to, to, uh, um, to use the data that we captured in the field. And if there were holes in it, then well, I mean, there were holes in it, but it was, it, it's the real thing. What, what you see is, is really real and it can, be, it's metric, it can be measured in its scale. Now we're jumping 10 years ahead. As I said, I went back uh, together with Heinz and with Steven and also some interns back in 2017. And now we had a complete different kind of instrument means. So uh, now the development of the laser scan over 10 years was very rapidly. In between there was other models as well from Leica, which were also fast and good, but this is now the new generation in 2017, which is from a company called ZNF, which are based in Germany and they, Call the scanners, there's the Imager 5010C and the 5010X. The C stands for color. So the 5010C had a built in camera as well, and it took HDR. So you're able to create HDR panoramas, which then in the end can be projected on the point cloud of the scan. And the 5010X. Um, has a camera built as well, but on top of it, it also had a built-in GPS. So just now, I would like to show you the difference or point it out. So on the left, you see the 2017 scanner. So this scanner, the way it is, it, it all has built in, it has built in the battery, it has built in the control unit. So practically the laptop is built in. On the right, you can see the huge battery, all the cables, having a laptop. So everything over 10 years was now becoming smaller, more easier to, well, yeah, smaller, easier to build in, more compact, and in the end easier to use because every time when you have to use or change the position of a scan, it obviously goes more, much quicker. But also the, the instrument itself, the capabilities of collecting data enhanced. So, 
between a factor of five and 10, depends on which laser scans you compare, but, uh, um, and the amount which would would, uh, which you could capture also increased. So here, uh, what we did in 2017, also we took now pictures with an SLR camera of the site. And we, we like Roshan pointed out, we're taking a lot of pictures. I mean, we didn't come back with 20,000 at that time here, but uh, with a few thousand, I think two and a half thousand pictures we had manually taken. Uh, I mean, for the complex and for the great enclosure. And these are two interns that joined us. Um, and on the, on the right here, the drone imagery, we, we plan to fly on site in 2017 with our drone, but we didn't get the permission to fly. So we couldn't fly. But luckily it turned out that somebody else flew. It was Daniel Löwenborg and Ezekiel Tetwa, which flew the site uh, probably a year before we got there. Oh, well, in, so in 2016, I, I, I believe. And we kindly could use their imagery also then to, to create our then new 3D model from 2017. Here's some more statistics. So the Hill Complex in 2017, we took 146 scans and the Great Enclosure 2008. So it's, it's slightly more, but also in a less time. So we spent, I think we spent there, uh, uh, four days and we did definitely much more scanning as we could do with three scanners um, in eight days before. Here now is kind of an oblique shot of the 3D model, but the 3D model you already seen in that video I showed you, but now to compare on the top right, this one in gray, this is the model from 2007 a little with the holes. I mean, it, it, it was that time, I mean, we're still proud of what, what we did that time and, and, and the plans and the GIS that we created is still valid today. So we, we, we didn't create a new GIS based on, sorry, based on our new data, but we, we, we were able to create a much, much better 3D model, as you can see here, textured and complete. So, the secret for that is the completeness is that we also use today, not just the laser scan data, we also incorporate photography. So I was telling before, going back, so taking pictures. So these pictures that, 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 that uh, these two take, were taken and the drone photography were incorporated to create this model. And here you can see um, now, an elevation on the top of the 3D model. <coughs> Sorry, I'm doing something. And in the bottom, uh, I created a section. So I cut it horizontal, uh, vertical through the building, through the structure. And it, it's fantastic. I mean, you, I mean, no one has seen kind of this, this, this photo or this sections before because the data were just not, not there. <coughs> Sorry. So this is now the, the 3D model of the Hill Complex. So also um, quite different from the black and white version to 10 years later. And you will find the 3D models on uh, the BMM website. If you go there to Great Zimbabwe, you will be able to find these models. <coughs> Sorry. And you can uh, uh, watch them, I mean, op open them and you can browse around. Uh, this is a top view. I think I'm press pressing time I have to. So this is a top view of the 3D model. And I think I'm through now. Thank you very much. And from, and now Bruce will take over the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let me just share my screen. Okay, yeah, and thank you to Stefan and Alex for organizing this as well. It's a, uh, yeah, it's a privilege to be able to share uh, with you. I'm, I'm just gonna be doing a quick 
talk on the Kua Ruins, which is a site that we visited in August 2018 um, as a Somani team. And that's the first time we uh, met Stefan and worked with him. And it was a very successful trip. So um, let me just show you where we are going. So Kua is on Juwani Island. Uh, if you can see my mouse, it's in the little red square on the right hand side here in Tanzania. Um, beautiful place, lovely place to work and um, not the easiest place in the world to get to if you have to travel by boat to get to the site. And some mornings the tide is so low the boat can't reach the beach and you have to walk for a kilometer in the water carrying your equipment on your shoulders. Um, other mornings, not so bad. The boat can take you straight into the site. So th these are just some pictures of getting to the Kua ruins, um, which, oh, there's some more pictures here. Just to give you an impression of the site, it's made up of mosques and some houses, and there's a, a palace there as well. Um, and the site is threatened from, from climate and also from unmanaged tourism. So it's, it's, it's really great that we've been able to get there and, and capture this data uh, with Stefan. This is just an overview shot from our drone looking south. So that's sort of the central area of, of the Kua ruins. And in amongst all these trees, there are other, struct other structures hidden, which you can't see right now. So this just shows you some of the equipment we used while we were documenting the site. So we would use GPS measurements, drone photography, terrestrial photography with an SLR, DSLR camera. And as Ralph has explained, uh, we all know laser scanners very well now. So that's the laser scanner we had with us. So in our processing, we will take all of the data from all these different instruments and, and merge them to create the 3D models and all of our other projects, uh, products, sorry. So this is a very sort of simplified rough pipeline of how we generate our 3D models. So firstly, we acquire the photos and the laser scans and the GPS measurements in the field. And um, we link all the laser scans together. We call it registering the laser scans. And so that they all uh, form one big giant point cloud. Um, then these get joined with all the pictures that we take from the drone and the uh, terrestrial photography. And our software reality capture produces then very, very detailed 3D models of the buildings that we've uh, documented. Um, they then get simplified and we apply some color to them based on the photography. And then they get shared to the various platforms like Roshan mentioned earlier, goes to Ziva Hub or we upload them to Sketchfab. Um, and that's how the models are hosted for the Black Monuments Matter website. And we can use them for virtual reality or many other uh, applications. So that's just a, a very simplified pipeline that can take months, depending on the size of the structure. So yes, that's a yeah, very simplified uh, pipeline. So here we can see what the 3D model is made up of. So we're kind of breaking it down. So starting on the left, we've got in, in the yellow, those are the point, that's the point cloud in 3D, which gets generated from the laser scanner and from the drone pictures and the terrestrial photographs. So you start off with this point cloud, which then gets triangulated. So millions and millions of little triangles get formed in the software. And then a, a surface gets applied to that, this sort of silvery uh, portion here. And then in the end, the color gets applied. So it looks like this on the right hand side. So one of the most important uh, developments in our workflow is, is the addition of, of a drone and the ability to take 
pictures from the air. Um, of course, the drone can see things that we can't see from the ground. So if we had just scanned this structure here on the left, one of the mosques, uh, we would not have been able to get any detail on top of the wall just because we physically can't see it from the scanner. So thankfully the drone can be used. We fly around and take hundreds of pictures and then we are able to model the top of the wall and, and any other features like this uh, big tree next to us here. Um, on the top right, you can just see the drone in action. We sometimes have to fly it quite low to get details. Um, and then on the bottom right, it's just another overview picture of the beautiful site. A very useful uh, application of the drone photography is the ability to generate an ortho photo or an, an aerial image of the site. So on the top left here, you can see each one of these white dots is where we took a drone photo. That's about 600 meters long running in a northwest direction and about 500 meters east-west. And yeah, it's about 750 pictures and we stitch them all together and we combine them with our GPS measurements. And on the right hand side, you can see voila, there is an ortho image very, very high resolution. You can zoom right in. I think each pixel on that image is about three centimeters on the ground. So it's fantastic. You can, you can actually measure on that image. You can measure the lengths of the buildings that you can see, etc. So it, it's a great uh, foundation for other products like the GISs that we create on the bottom left here, a geographical information system. So we can use the aerial photo as a backdrop and the plans can be superimposed on top of that. This dotted line on the left is the edge of the mangrove where it meets the beach. So it's yeah, very useful to have an ortho photo. Okay, let me pause that. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna deviate now quickly um, back to what Roshan was talking about, the House of Wonders. Um, this is the video is a, an extract of the virtual reality which we created when we visited Zanzibar recently. We took it with us and we were able to show it to some of the people involved in the project, some, uh, some of the officials there. And they were able to now see something that has vanished or disappeared. And it just um, really highlighted for me the, the value of having this 3D data available so that we could create something that could be explored or used um, as for site management, for tourism. Um, so I'll, I'll let you see it, just to give you a quick glimpse of what the virtual reality of the House of Wonders could look like. So th these rooms that we're looking at now have actually disappeared. They no longer exist. This room still exists. Um, it doesn't look quite like this anymore. It's full of scaffolding and dust, but yeah, it, it's absolutely incredible to see something that has fallen down. And we can go up to the roof now and see the clock tower, which has disappeared. Yeah. So it's just one of the very useful applications for virtual reality. Okay, so the next video I'm gonna show you is back to Kua. Um, and it was made using our 3D models and they've been placed into a virtual environment, uh, fake trees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just a, a quick animation to kind of give you an idea of what the site looks like.
So all of these 3D models could potentially be added into virtual reality. Okay, let me just show you, a th I'm just gonna th show you one of the 3D models now uh, from Kua and an extract of the Panorama Tour. So here we have, I think it's house number four at, um, at Kua. So this is one of the complete 3D models with the texture on it. Um, and we can navigate around it. We can measure on this. We can make plans from this. It's uh, got a very high resolution sort of color on it. You can do many things with this 3D model. Um, and I hope it was useful for, for Stefan. We'll have to ask him in private. But uh, so that's, that's the 3D model of one of the buildings. So we've got all of the buildings at Kua modeled like this. Okay, and then I can show you the panorama tour. Roshan has showed you a similar one from Moroi. And we've got a panorama tour like this for the whole of the site of Kua with the mini maps on the top right. So we can jump from structure to structure and uh, explore the site like this. And I believe this is on the Black Monuments website as well. So you can explore this in your own time, really get to know and get the feel of the site in your own time. And that is it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks, Bruce. That was great. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Paul. And uh, thank you for these fantastic presentations. In fact, uh, technology doesn't look boring at all when it is well explained. And uh, about the deadly, deadly spider that you mentioned, you know, Ralph, we had yes. some similar uh, experiences, you know, with the snakes in Gedi and also the giant centipedes, you know, in, in Kilwa. And I even uh, you, maybe you saw them also. And one member of uh, my team, Arturo, was uh, bitten by those. To reassure him with my colleague Pierre that you know very well, we just told him now we will see if it is deadly or not. <laughs> <laughs> so more, it, it was fine. More seriously, I would like to add that it was and it is really a pleasure uh, to work with uh, uh, the Zamani team. And uh, first, because you are very independent, you don't need, uh, uh, I don't need, or you don't need to stay with you. Uh, you are completely independent, you know what to do, you, you have the experience, you know, you work on so many sites. So it's really a pleasure. And also maybe because you are from South Africa, you are very resistant, you know, to the trom tropical climate, humidity and difficulties that uh, 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 you mentioned, Bruce, you know, like for example, in, uh, in Kua and uh, the fact that you have to bring your own batteries, and we had problem. We didn't have electricity. We didn't have even running water, and so on. So, it is always. It was very interesting to that you showed. You know the uh, the things you know behind the work. You know the daily life. Second, so, uh, what you did, you know, and what you are doing is essential, and it is not for fun. Uh, it is not something fashionable because nowadays, you know, everybody is talking about digital humanities. Uh, it is useful, as you demonstrated, for conservation architects. It is useful for archaeologists because the data that uh, you mentioned, you know, the data that you produce on Kua, they are enormous. And uh, because I have many projects and uh, I'm also, I continue to work on, uh, I'm still working on the, on the data that you produce and hopefully an article will be published soon. And also what you are doing is useful for the general public because uh, you made these sites, you know, visible and accessible for all. And uh, it is extremely, uh, extremely uh, important because a lot of sites are located in remote areas. 
and difficult to access. So it is absolutely vital uh, what you did and what you are uh, doing. Now, I believe that uh, we have a few more minutes uh, left for uh, questions for Q&A. So um, I don't know what we can do if I have to read the question. Or maybe, Alex, do you mind to read the questions? I don't mind at all. Um, so Zina Beeling has asked, um, this is about the House of Wonders, um, did the 2019 scan on the House of Wonders not pick up some of the structural issues that led to the collapse of the building in December? And if not, are there lessons that can be learned from this and could changes be implemented to the surveying activities going forward to ensure that this type of structural risk is picked up? So I think what we can say here is we are working with the old data set and the new data set with structural engineers from the WMF and UNESCO and the government of Tanzania at the moment to address uh, this issue. Like, like I said initially, we gather the data, we make the 3D models. And what, uh, this, what Zina is asking is something very specific. This is this is structural engineers that need to analyze the data, and we are not. Again, I will remind you what we said before. We do not interpret the data. We gather the data, and we pass it along to the relevant authorities, and they base their decisions on the data. We give them, this is the quality of the data. It's accurate to that amount. And we say, this is it. We did augment it. We didn't close any holes. And also, what we need to understand with laser scanning it doesn't go underground. It's not like, like ground penetrating radar. You will see only what you see with your eyes. So if there's, if there's a piece of metal underneath the ground that is missing, or I don't know, you, you don't see anything underground. You see, you get what you see, basically. It's like light, light waves. So unfortunately, I, I cannot comment more on that at the moment. And rough. No, thank you, Roj. I think you explained it yeah. correctly. Yeah. I yeah. don't have to add anything there. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? It is lunch time, so I don't know if we don't have any questions. I have one uh, small question for you, uh, Ralph. When you showed, you know, you showed the main gate, you know, in the Great Zimbabwe, the, the, the enclosures, the main enclosures. I saw a lot of little stones, you know, above the door, and I was wondering because normally you need to have a lentil or an arch, you know. And uh, do you have any idea, or did you have any explanation about? Oh, and why is they use these little stones? No, unfortunately, I, I can't answer that, your question. I, I, I don't know. Okay, yeah, because it's what you said, you, you are not doing that interpretation, but I was thinking that maybe you have um, some information about mm. that because it's not something usual. Yes, you're right, but I, unfortunately, I, I can't answer that, I don't know. And I, I have to add something maybe about the question that you got, you know, about uh, uh, um, Zanzibar and the Palace of Wonder. Uh, what you said, Roshan, that the fact that you cannot penetrate the structure, but also I don't remember when you did, which year you did your survey, and the accident happened last December. And I saw some scaffoldings, and I, I think they were doing also some works, you know. So a lot of things could happen, you know, in between your survey and the accident. Yeah, this, this building um, is, was already in a bad state in 2019. If I'm correct, the part of the roof was not there and it has been degrading over many years. And, uh, and who knows what was the state of the building in you know, the, the foundations or some other parts that we don't know. But again, uh, the, the, we can't comment on that. We, we leave that to the experts in this field. We have also another question. Salima Bartia, I'm going to ask you to, to read out your question because I can see you have your hand raised. 
I just wanted to thank you very much for the presentation. I, it's the second time I've heard um, some of you speak and it's just, it really brings to life all of these um, uh, kind of, um, yeah, uh, uh, historical sites and, and it's really nice to see see that 3D um, uh, and virtual reality element. I was just interested to know how, if you've got any examples where you've been able to work either through with students or with local communities to revitalize interest in some of these um, sites and assets so that they've got, you know, how have they got involved um, in sort of ongoing work whether it's through preservation or just integrating it into their own uh, curriculum and education um, locally and um, just have you got any examples of that uh maybe i can say a little bit to that so uh, when the project started uh and when i joined in 2005 and we had this melon grant uh so the principle was like this that we would go to a site which was decided by four for archaeologists and his historian, they would choose something and, and we would go there. The local authorities are always involved or somebody on site to get permissions. And what was the idea was that time that from our data, we gave them the data and they even got a, a like a computer. I mean, they got, we, we, we did involve teaching. So we gave an, uh, uh, like a GIS courses for a week for five days, so we we try to to train people to to use not necessarily the three D data, but to creating maps two D data. So the the maps that I showed of of the hill complex and the great enclosure is based on the three D stuff. But so we we try to to bring it closer to the people that work can work with that and can use it for site management. And I had a very nice experience. My very first trip was in 2005, was to Lalibela, which is in Ethiopia. This uh, church is carved out of the stone. Very, very fascinating. And then I was involved creating maps of the site. And now, I, like over 10 years later, I went back to the site, but not to work, just to kind of we worked by Jemel Hanna Christos, which is about two hours drive away from that, but we were staying in Lalibela. And suddenly I saw one of the maps that we created where, where I was involved, placing there and explaining the site. So, so, so that was, and it was, it was not just us, it was also the people there who augmented or put information into our basic work. So, so yeah, so. So that was really uh, um, nice to see. So I hope to answer a little bit your, your question. Okay. I just want to add something to that. Um, every year, not in the last couple of years, but we had lots of interns that work with us at, at the university. We, yeah. over the last 15 years, we have probably about 50 rough. We normally get about two to three every year from uh, a lot from Europe, from the US, from uh, Madagascar and, and from South Africa and some students from the department as well. So we have lots of students because all the work that we do is, is a lot, it's very data intensive. It's a lot of manual work. It's, it's a lot of computation as well, but there's things to be cleaned, the photos to be post processed. So a lot of students, they get exposed to the, the data processing pipeline. Um, the, the, the other thing, like Ralph said, uh, we often, uh, when we work on a site, we have uh, curators from the museum coming from the respective countries and they've got maybe junior staff and they get to see what, what we do and they come along with us on the trips and we train them on sometimes, if they want, on basic things like how to take a panorama you know how to do how to do GIS, and unfortunately we cannot train them on on, on the laser scanner because that's just it's just not going to work in a short time frame. It takes us years to to do this thing, and it's it's not right to tell someone you can do this in a, in in a week. It doesn't make sense. 
So we show them the weaknesses and strengths of each method. And for the simpler ones, we show them what you can do. I mean, how to do it. And the laser scan data, I must confess, uh, a lot of people are still very, very afraid of it. And they don't even want to get close to that. So this is something that uh, we want to address in the future and how people use our data, how to get it more integrated into the work of architects and engineers. And uh, these are the things that um, we, we work with Stefan and we, we want to pick his brain more about how he uses the data. And that's what makes it valuable. If no one uses it, it has no value. If, 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 I may, if I may add, uh, Roshan, is the fact also that uh, you join, you know, the project, you know, in Cuba, in Mafia, as externals, you know, as specialists. So it is also very important to mention that you join existing projects. And this existing project, like in Cuba with Pierre Blanchard and the World Monument Fund, we are working with and for the local communities. So all the people are locals. We, I remember one morning you did a training, you know, about 3D models, you know, and what you are doing in Mafia. And uh, it's what we did with Pierre and the World Monument Fund and the UNESCO in Kilwa a few years ago. We are always working for the local communities. We had two field schools, one field school of conservation and one field school of Islamic archeology. span So it is also something in collaboration with the Tanzanian antiquities, and universities, for example, I'm thinking about Egypt, but we didn't work together in Egypt, but it was exactly the same in Egypt. So it was also something that I wanted to add. We have a, another question. Um, Yi Chuan has joined us from Taipei, and she has two questions. And there seems to be another stone structure next to the closure in Zimbabwe. Is it common to have two structures um, directly adjacent to each other there? And also, what do you do with objects that are retrieved on site? Okay, maybe I can answer this a little bit. Yes, so, so um, the great enclosure is, is the biggest uh, uh, structure there, but next to it, there are also a circular or a wave stone stone walls, which reaches kind of through the whole valley. But uh, there's nothing really that big. I mean, we, we documented it, everything uh, in the GIS, which we got in the end from a satellite image. I mean, in 2007, we didn't have a drone. We, we were not able to, to fly there ourselves, but the possibility was to, to buy a set satellite image from this area, which I think that time we're talking about maybe a pixel had about 50 centimeter resolution. So one pixel shows you kind of 50 centimeter of an area. And with, with this, we were able to kind of digitize or get an overview of the whole site. So we could pick up other walls, smaller structures as well. But there's not, not such, I mean, the, the, the great enclosure and the hill complex, these are the the, the big ones, which, yeah. I hope this answered the question. What, what was the second question? It was um, what you did with objects which are retrieved on site. Oh, uh, no, although uh, we, we trying, or, or, or we, we are not archeologists. We, we, we also try to not move anything and not touch, we have, I mean, we had permission to, to get onto the wall, for example, and, and here and there to, to acquire the data, but they just told us you, we just want set up on this high wall. And normally we are trying to avoid uh, um, contact with the structure of the thing. So, so we didn't uh, uh, retrieve, I mean, if I stand it correctly, the, that you think with some objects. So we didn't took anything from the site just our 3D data and pictures and panoramas. We are looking at them and you can be sure that they didn't take any objects on the sites. Yeah, so, so we, we are very strict, I mean, yeah, to, to not destroy something there. I mean, our work is luckily, I mean, the laser scan itself, it doesn't do any harm to any structure. So 
So this is a kind of a, you know, very harmless, non, non uh, destructive tool to document something accurate in 3D. So, yeah. Pleasure. I just read here. Thank you very much. So. <laughs> Other questions? I don't see any hands raised and I don't see anything else in the chat. Okay. And so you are right on time because we said from 12 to 1.30. So I would like to express my gratitude and as a name for the name as a the name of the Aga Khan University. I would like to thank you not only for the work that you did in Cuba, but also for the exhibition and uh, for all uh, your presentation and your lecture today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Stefan, it was a pleasure. It was a great thank pleasure. Thank you very much. And thanks the audience, thanks everybody for taking the time to listen to us, what we have to say, and visit the Zamani website and uh, enjoy and the, and, and the BMM website. BMM. And, yes. And then, uh, yeah, enjoy it and keep healthy. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining.